Hello everybody, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Jason Lindsay and I live at Headingham Castle, uh, which this really fun uh, video vlog is being done about. So today my task is to talk about the history of Headingham and really we're going to concentrate on the site. Um, in the background is the keep, the Norman keep, and that was built, finished at around 11.30, which is rather incredible, it's not a time of day, but actually uh, 11.30 in 930 or 40 years ago. Um, it was taken originally, uh, the, um, the De Veres came over with William the Conqueror. Uh, they were one of the leading knights, Norman knights, and they, um, uh, after winning the Battle of uh, Hastings, uh, they were rewarded with large chunks of England and heading and belonged to a Saxon thane called Alwine. He had it uh, taken away from him and it was granted to Alberic de Vere. Um, his, uh, there would have been a, a, a timber castle in those days, and we don't know the extent of it, but it probably would have been a wooden castle with a defensive wall going around part of the very small village. His grandson, uh, Aubrey de Vere, was made uh, the first Earl of Oxford. Basically, they became one of the most illustrious of the medieval families in the entire country and wealthiest and most powerful and they've rather disappeared from view today because the 20th Earl of Oxford died out in 1704. Um, the first Earl of Oxford he thought he would build himself a rather nice tower and uh, this is the result uh, and there is a theory that it was built for a, just for a party because labour was free and the expense was stone and what is incredible about heading up is that the whole thing was faced in stone and there was no stone in Essex so this had to come from a, a quarry that uh, is now believed to be next to Burley House in Stamford in Lincolnshire nearly 70 miles and you didn't have um, you didn't have Eddie Stobart or a train so all that stone had to be cut in the quarry and hand brought basically by horse and carriage or uh, cart or river um, all the way here so it's, you, that, they were that wealthy that they could uh, face the entire Headingham in stone and that's why it is one of the best preserved Norman keeps in Western Europe. Um, obviously the, the castle is not just the thing behind me, the tower behind me, the keep. That's one little element of the castle and it's essentially the defensive site and it is a covers, it's a figure of eight and there is a map that uh, you'll be able to have a look at showing the extent of the earthworks but that would have all been dubbed by hand, no diggers in those days. and huge earthworks would have been done and we're standing on one part of the figure of eight which is about three acres three to four acres and where the house is now the 18th century house that is probably another two to three acres so on a very big scale and this was like a mini village a fortified village with a big wall ten foot high probably four foot wide all the way around it uh, we know there was a church here a small church there was a great hall in the Norman period accommodation towers kitchens and when the Earl of Oxford wasn't uh, you know, on a crusade or with the court or suppressing some local rebellion, they were back here and there was probably, we were, we were, were led to believe about 200 uh, people in residence, the, the, the armourer and the medicine man and the, the, the person making the cloth, the cloth and people bringing tapestries and pewter and it would have been a hive of activity and then it would have been a very small garrison when they weren't here. Um, so this, this is rather exciting, we've, um, during lockdown we've done quite a lot of scraping back and removing of trees and um, this uh, is the base of the, one of the accommodation towers from the Tudor Castle and we had no idea it was quite so extensive. Um, and where we've got to, uh, we've, we've stopped obviously because it gets to the point where you're actually, you know, we can't, we're not allowed to, because it's scheduled monument, we're not allowed to do any excavation. So, we're waiting for a visit from English Heritage and then whether we dig down because this we now realise this wonderful octagonal thing might have had a staircase in it, a spiral staircase. We've got another one over there. And then we keep finding these, you probably can't see it, but that's a the glazed dark brick. And there's a few of these and it probably showed the diamond pattern in the walls. Um, and this is the front the front wall here. Um, and it's massively thick and it probably went up 70 foot 
and if it mirrors the, uh, the tower at Oxborough, first floor would have had the King's Chamber, top floor would have had the Queen's Chamber. Um, and this, we believe, is where Henry VII would have stayed for that famous week in the 1490s when he found the Earl of Oxford. So it's a really important bit of heading in history. So what we're hoping is that under, lurking under that, the front of that octagonal tower, we've got another great big bit of brick and it would just really uh, help show our visitors the extent of the Tudor castle because we, apart from the bridge we don't have any of the buildings still existing and I'm hoping when we dig down here there'll just be a, there might well be a seven or eight foot wall so we get a massive bit of the tower exposed um, but obviously as soon as you do that you're then going to have to conserve it um, and this wall behind me made up of bits of the other Tudor castle, ruined bits of the Tudor castle, and in fact it doesn't actually relate to this tower, so that was a bit of a red herring. But it's in really bad condition and we're going to have to work out how to disturb it. So the idea here is that we just have a quick look at the valley wall, which shows the, the earthworks that would have been done, um, all dug by hand, to help create the defensive, because the castle really is about the walls and the defensive earthworks. And once you're in, you're really, you have to surrender. Um, we know that they, at um, Rochester, they dug down and they had to sacrifice uh, 40 pigs in the tunnel. And then the pit props collapsed and uh, one of the corners collapsed. And then the uh, invading forces of King John got in there and slaughtered all 25 people inside, or the rebellious baron, whoever it was, inside there at the time. Heading uh, either uh, surrendered or negotiated a truce so we didn't get badly damaged that's why we're in such incredible condition but it's worth having a look at the earthworks and the, the extraordinary condition they're still in although we've lost the walls the, the earth is pretty amazing so you have to imagine a sort of invading force you're sort of clad in armor you're pretty knackered and then you've got to get up these walls here um, and at the top uh, hostile uh, defenders on a 10 foot high wall firing arrows pouring oil it can't have been a lot of fun it must have been pretty difficult to breach, breach the perimeter um, and it doesn't take long when you're when you're looking um, to find uh, oyster shells uh, which basically there was the sort of common food um, and obviously we're quite a long way from the sea and uh, the, so the, the, the worker begged apparently not to be fed oysters because it was the most uh, easy food I don't really understand why or how but tons and tons and tons of these shells are everywhere and they just chucked them down the bank and nowadays oysters are a delicacy but in those days it was a uh, normal basic fare So what I, I wanted to show you was the, the extent of the, sort of the, the mound, really. Um, you know, trying to get up this, uh, imagine the wall at the top. It's a pretty significant construction. It's incredible that it hasn't slumped in the last 950 years. You know, it's still pretty well as it was. Um, and that is on a very big scale, over sort of seven or eight acres. Um, so anyway, so history-wise, so Tudor times, um, the, yeah, the height of the castle was the, the, the royal visit um, when uh, Henry VII uh, fi unjustly fined the Earl of Oxford all that money for having his men in livery, wearing the blue boar to the Vere arms, uh, lining down the drive as he left. And um, really after that, yeah, the, the 17th Earl of Oxford lived in London most of his life and there is a theory that he was the uh, Shakespeare author which does annoy all the Stratfordians. I think it's quite an interesting theory to follow. Um, and the problem was he sold uh, 84,000 acres including uh, uh, West Kensington, Olympia, Earl's Court, which was frustrating. Um, and really kind of was the beginning of the ruin of the De Vere's. Um, and the De Vere's died out uh, with the 20th Earl of Oxford and Headingham really passed to a, a cousin by that point. Um, 
Um, so this is fun. This just shows the close-up of the Tudor castle. So you have to imagine Henry VII arriving with a couple of hundred retainers and courtiers, um, really to thank the Earl of Oxford for helping him win the Battle of Bosworth. It was the uh, he was a sort of much wiser uh, and more senior general, and he mustered an army and joined Henry at the Bosworth battlefield and it was a pretty close run thing I think they were outnumbered by Richard's forces but his vanguard apparently helped win the battle um, so he was given heading and back and pretty quickly built a very splendid Tudor palace and this was the actual bridge this is uh, a pretty amazing survivor from the 1490s um, and it's seen a lot of history it's rather wonderful and it would have replaced the original drawbridge uh, this was always a dry moat People love to think there was water here, but there's no way logistically we could have had water. Um, and you had to get through various uh, towers with portcullises before you got this far. And originally you would have come over and there was a barbican we know about, which is essentially a murder hole. So walls either side and people would have been able to fire down at you from above. And we got through the portcullis. And unusually, normally they stuck out over the... Uh, it, over the the, the, the essentially what would have been the moat but our one goes into because they couldn't have physically built it and we found the base of the foundations the um, the, uh, the flints in the mortar um, so this strange bit of ruined building is that in fact the fall building and uh, the experts think it was put on about 10 years later than the rest of the building they suddenly thought right we need a bit more space um, and we believe it hold, held the dungeon uh, for the prisoners and a safer stair to get up into the first floor. The stairs apparently used to come straight out, out from the main door. But it's amazing what you find when you have a look in. So we put this platform over about eight years ago. Um, but what, what you can see is that you've got the original building there with the arrow slit, and then they've slapped this over it. And you've even got some of the original sort of curvy stones coming out one there, this one. So the building used to come out and this uh, basically because it, it juts out into the ground this was anti-tumbling originally um, and meant it instead of it having only 10 foot of wall to tunnel through uh, it was probably 15 or 20 foot if you dug underneath the ground. It's pretty incredible. So here what we've discovered when we got all the ivy off is this actually was a barrel vaulted ceiling in just this section and we think the guard, guard house here come down some stairs, gone through a couple of doors and then you're incarcerated in this tiny space.